OK, I think we will get started. So hello, everyone, and welcome to today's uh, GeoActive webinar on Introducing Experienced Eye, a new automated feature selection tool for machine learning within IP. So thank you all for joining us today. Um, for those that don't know me, I'm Andy McDonald, one of the product managers for Interactive Petrophysics, and my focus is on applying AI and machine learning techniques to petrophysical workflows. So what are we going to be covering in today's uh, webinar? Well, first off, before we jump into Experienced Eye and IP, we first need to cover some of the basics and the background theory, as not everybody uh, listening in will be familiar with that topic. So first of all, we will have a look at what machine learning is at a very high level, and this includes the types of machine learning, its applications, and the general workflow. And then we're going to look at a specific part of the machine learning workflow known as feature selection and what benefits it brings, as well as an overview of the different feature selection methods that we use within our experienced eye module. And then we'll jump on to looking at our latest module, which aims to streamline and automate the process of identifying the best input curves for a petrophysical machine learning model. And this will include a live demo within, within interactive petrophysics. And after that, we will do a Q&A at the end of the session. And if you have any questions during the presentation, please submit them through the, the Q&A option within Teams up on the toolbar or via the chart. And if there are a large number of questions and we don't have enough time to answer them all, then we will get back to uh, those questions after the webinar. So I'll just turn off my uh, camera just to um, make things a little bit easier with, with bandwidth and uh, distractions. OK. So many of you on the call today will be aware of what IP or interactive petrophysics is. But for those who are not, IP is an industry leading subsurface data analysis and interpretation package. And it's been around for over two decades and was originally started off as an open hole well log interpretation package. And over the years, IP has developed and expanded and now helps you with characterizing all aspects of your reservoir. IP still has petrophysics at its core, however, it can be used by all subsurface disciplines, including geologists, geophysicists, reservoir engineers, uh, case hole engineers, and um, uh, people that are involved with machine learning and uh, production engineering. So IP was initially focused on the exploration and appraisal stage of the de of a development, and it is now a product that can be used throughout the entire life cycle of an asset all the way from exploration, appraisal, development, production, and eventually to abandonment. So let's have a look at today's main topic, which is machine learning, and we will then get on to feature selection. So before we do that, we need to understand what machine learning is and how it fits within the wider artificial intelligence space. So AI or artificial intelligence is a very vast discipline that covers computer vision, robotics, expert systems, speech processing, machine learning, and a number of other sub related subdivisions. And AI is the science and engineering of making computers behave in ways that emulate how humans behave and emulates human level intelligence. So, um, Within AI, we've got machine learning, which is the ability for machines to learn rules and patterns from data without being explicitly programmed to do so. This means that we initially train models to start with, and any time new data is presented to the, the machine learning algorithms, they should be able to handle that data and interpret it. In other words, the algorithms that we use should be able to generalize to new data without memorizing patterns within the training data. So a further subdivision of machine learning is deep learning, and it uses deep or multi-layered neural networks, which can be quite complex, and they're designed to mimic how the human brain works. So the human brain contains neurons, and within uh, neural networks, we have neurons or nodes, which are said to mimic the, the human brain neurons. In recent months, uh, generative AI has increased in popularity. I'm sure you're all aware of tools such as ChatGPT, Perplexity, Claude, any other uh, ones that are popping up uh, at the moment. And these um, 
tools are basically a subset of deep learning and that they generate new previously unseen data or content which is based on the patterns that's learned from the existing data so we can ask these bots or ai bots and when we ask it questions it generates new content from what it has been trained on so with looking at machine learning how does it differ from traditional programming. In traditional programming, we set the rules and pass in the data. So our rules would be if then else statements, while, while loops, for loops, uh, case statements, different types of logic that control the flow of um, the data through, through the program. And then we arrive at an answer. In machine learning, we actually provide the data and the answers to the algorithm. And from that, the algorithm is able to work out what rules can be applied to that data to get at the desired answers. So we are providing a data set that contains the labels or the answers. And then once we've got those rules, we can then apply it to new data sets, and then we should be able to make predictions and infer um, conclusions from that. So, at a very high level, we'll just look at the at machine learning and the different types of machine learning, and then we'll look at the machine learning workflow. So within machine learning, there are three main types, supervised, unsupervised learning, and reinforcement learning. So with supervised learning, it is the most common and practical of machine learning tasks, and it is designed to learn from example. So we give the algorithm a set of data that contains the correct outputs or the correct answers and then we train the model on that data and then we can use it to produce new outputs and examples of this within petrophysics uh, are fascist prediction permeability prediction synthetic uh, anywhere where we where we want to predict a, a log measurement Unsupervised learning, on the other hand, is used to identify the underlying patterns and relationships in the data without the need for labels. So we don't have a set of answers. So it's basically grouping the data together based on the characteristics of that data. And these methods, uh, as I say, focus on the data features or the input curves rather than the actual labels. So within, again, within petrophysics and geoscience, we can use it for fascist prediction as well as detecting outliers. And then we have reinforcement learning, which is goal oriented and it seeks to um, make decisions in order to achieve complex objectives based on its interactions with its environment without the need for supervision. And these algorithms uh, seek to cumulatively maximize their reward each iteration by using the experience from previous iterations. So if we have a closer look at uh, supervised and unsupervised learning, Supervised learning can be further broken down into regression and classification-based tasks. Regression-based tasks allow us to predict a continuous and variable numeric output. So this would be our permeability or rho B or our synthetic shear. So these curves are continuously variable. Classification, on the other hand, allows us to predict a discrete output. They take the input data and map it to an output category. So in our example, this would be fascies or reservoir rock types. With a non-supervised learning side of things, we have clustering and dimensionality reduction. So clustering and unsupervised learning identifies the patterns within the data without the labels. So you may have come across uh, an algorithm called k-means clustering, and basically it's just grouping the data points around uh, the mean of that data, and then it's trying to optimize where those data points fall in relation to that, that mean. So that's doing it without labels. And we can use it to do fascist classification, uh, but we would need then to use our domain expertise to understand and recognize what those fascists that uh, are that have been calculated from that algorithm. So we would need that, that domain knowledge. We can also use it for automatic outlier detection, and we'll see an example of that uh, shortly uh, in, one, one, in one of the next slides. And then we have dimensionality reduction, and this is where we've taken multiple inputs and reducing them down to a more meaningful number of inputs. So this includes algorithms such as principal component analysis, where we are applying some transforms to the, the input data to um, extract the, the most 
variation within that data and um, uh, then we can reduce that data set down uh, to a limited number of curves. So this shouldn't be confused with what we're going to talk about with uh, uh, feature selection um, and that, that's slightly different. So within IP, we have a number of uh, supervised and unsupervised learning modules. On the supervised learning side, we have neural networks, multilinear regression, domain transfer analysis, and fuzzy logic. So DTA, or domain transfer analysis, is a proprietary module to IP, and it's mainly used for predicting uh, continuous outputs. Then we have uh, unsupervised learning uh, modules with PCA, principal component analysis, cluster analysis, and self-organizing maps. And the last two there can then be used to predict and um, create your fascias as well as your reservoir rock types. So understanding the basics of what machine learning is, what, what does that actually mean to us as uh, petrophysicists and geoscientists? Well, there's uh, various applications in petrophysics, and this is just an example of some of the ones that we've uh, discussed or touched on uh, in the previous slides. So we've got examples of fascias and rock type prediction, where we are taking, say, four logging curves, standard logging curves, and then making uh, predictions for our fascias. Then we've got outlier detection. Here we've got a neutron density cross plot. Uh, and just with two different algorithms, we can identify where our outliers are that have been caused by potential uh, washout. So that's where our data points are moving up towards the top right of the, the cross plot. So we can do that without needing to apply labels. And that could be a good start for uh, creating, say, a bad hole indicator. And once you've got that bad hole indicator, you can then use it for um, for flagging flagging intervals for repair. So we can use a multilinear regression or a neural network to create synthetic curves like we've got in the right where we've got our bulk density curve uh, where uh, it's uh, been affected by the washout. Then we can also use it for prediction. So prediction of uh, petrophysical properties um, can uh, we can use it for SW, porosity, permeability. As, uh, these are some of the common tasks. But this is not only the applications of machine learning to petrophysics. We can use it for automating some of the QC process, automating some of the, the depth shifting and uh, splicing of data. And there's a variety of applications uh, which uh, sort of span the whole of the petrophysics and geoscience domain. So now we've got a basic understanding of what machine learning is and the types of machine learning. We can now focus on how to apply that machine learning uh, to our to our data sets. So the machine learning workflow that I'm going to present here is very generic and just shows the, the high level steps in the process. These workflows can get quite complex and you can get into t the territory of ML ops, machine learning ops, which uh, basically goes through the whole life cycle of gathering the data, storing the data, and then um, building models and deploying it. So it's quite a quite a wide, um, uh, quite a large workflow for that. So we'll just keep things simple. Uh, so at the start, we start with an objective, and this objective tells us what uh, we need to collect in terms of data. So whether we're doing fascist prediction or permeability prediction, we need to know what data we have and what data we need to collect in order to be able to apply our models. So after that, we need to prepare the data, and this includes exploring the data, understanding our data, understanding the relationships, and carrying out any data QC and repair, as well as selecting the best features for our machine learning model. Then we select the algorithm. So this is this will be dependent on the objective for our um, our project. So if we're doing fascies, then we may want to use something um, such as action methods that we use k nearest neighbors or even uh, k means clustering to to group the data together. Or we may want to predict a continuous curve where we may use say a multilinear regression. 
once we've done that, once we've selected our, our algorithm, we can then split the, the data into training and testing subsets. The training data set is then used in the model and the testing data set is used to evaluate the results on the data. And when we test uh, our model on that data, we can then understand where we need to go back and either get more data, prepare more data, or select a different algorithm, or tune any of the hyperparameters within our um, machine learning model, which can then improve the, the results. So once we've successfully tested the, the, tested the model, we can then evaluate it on completely unseen data. And you may be familiar with the term uh, blind test well or a, or a blind test data set. And this is, allows us to understand how well our model is generalized to new data. So in the case with the test data before, we were using it to tune the model. So that data was continuously being seen by the modeling process. Whereas when we're evaluating it on new data, we are just uh, testing our final model on that unseen data and then taking it from there. Once we're satisfied with that, we can then deploy the model to a wider audience, but that doesn't mean that it's the end of the workflow. We can still receive feedback from users and then update the model, um, whether based on, say, new data or whether um, fashies are being mispredicted, et cetera. So we can then revise that model and go back to the start and uh, help tune that model to improve it. So this is just a slightly more expanded uh, machine learning workflow from the previous one. Again, it's not the, the most complicated one uh, out there, but th this shows the, the main steps uh, that we've just discussed. And what I want to highlight here is that when we take the, the data um, into the modeling stage, we carry out our exploratory data analysis and then we carry out the QC and repair, but we also carry out the feature selection, which is what we're going to focus on for this uh, particular presentation or the next few slides. So once we've done that, we can then take our prepared data and then through an iterative process, we can uh, train our models and um, tune the model, tune the parameters of the model and then evaluate that on new test data. So with feature selection, what is it? So feature selection is basically the process of identifying and selecting the most relevant or the most important features uh, from our data set. And that allows us to build more efficient and effective machine learning models. So in the machine learning domain, features refer to the individual columns within a data set uh, or the variables within the data set. But within the petrophysics and geoscience domain, we would call them our well logging curves or our petrophysical curves. So there's a little bit of uh, uh, terminology to, to pick up when you're uh, learning some of the, the machine learning uh, domain. So this, this slide basically illustrates the uh, process of feature selection. So if we're doing this manually, we're doing this with domain expertise, um, then uh, we can identify which curves or which features we want to remove from our model when we are then uh, making our prediction. So in reality, we may have a dozen or more input curves that could be everything from our standard logging curves to gas curves to um, core analysis data. And it can be difficult to decide which ones are, are the most relevant to our model. On the flip side, we could potentially exclude curves that uh, may contain information that may not be immediately obvious to us. So we could, for example, exclude rate of penetration from LWD. And at first thought, we may not consider adding this to the model and we may prefer our standard logging curves with gamma ray density, deep resistivity, neutron porosity, etc. Um, but that ROP curve could contain information about the rocks that we're drilling through and that could indicate whether the rocks are hard or soft and that could be important when we come through to our, our model and that will also depend um, and, and we may also rely on that if we have a limited data set so we need to get a little bit more information out of the data that we've acquired. So with this example we are taking uh, six logging curves uh, or wireline curves here, and we're attempting to predict permeability. And when we go through this manually using our domain expertise, we may end up dropping the tension curve. It's not really relevant to permeability, so we may drop that out. And then maybe deep resistivity, maybe we're not too 
too concerned about that. And instead, we want to focus on gamma ray, bulk density, neutron porosity, and DT. So we would then pass them into our model to make our predictions. So what are the benefits of doing this uh, or doing the feature selection process? Well, I said one is that it reduces the training time. So if we are feeding in more input data to our models, we can take longer to train the models and then uh, we may not have that time available and we may not be able to test multiple models within that time. It also improves interpretability. So if we are passing in features that we no. So if, if rather than 20 features, we, we are picking six features from that or six logging curves from that data set. We know what has gone into that model and we can understand what is happening much better. And it also reduces overfitting. So overfitting is a term where we are uh, memorizing the training data. So it's learned the patterns within the training data. But when we apply that model to new data or unseen data, then that model will perform poorly. So reducing that chance of overfitting um, can can be a big benefit when, when we're selecting the features. And it also improves and it's been around for over two decades. So if we've got 20 input curves, that doesn't mean that we will get a better model than one with, say, six input curves. Uh, so more data does not necessarily mean better models. We're basically adding more noise into the modeling process, which can then increase the chance of overfitting the, the model to our data. So it's all about selecting the most relevant and the most important features for our model. So I'm not going to go into too much depth about the different uh, methodologies within feature se selection. I'll just keep it at a high level and uh, explain the ones that we have um, included within our new module, which we will see shortly. So there are three main methods. There's filter methods, which essentially take the data and then filter it out based on statistics. And then we can take a subset of the results from that and then use that in our model. And then we've got wrapper methods, which sort of um, iteratively process uh, the, the data by taking subsets of that data and then evaluating the, the performance of the, the model against a, a statistic. So say a p-value, a probability value, which we'll see again shortly. And then embedded methods essentially um, contain the feature selection and the subsetting of the data and uh, model evaluation as part of the entire machine learning algorithm. So we um, so the algorithm is working out what the best subset of the data to use is uh, as part of that process. So we'll, we'll look at uh, filter methods and one of the most simplest or common methods is Pearson's correlation. So this is used for continuous outputs uh, or variable outputs. And in this case, we've got our, our original six input curves and we are attempting to predict permeability. And then we go through that, that process of Pearson's correlation. So Pearson's correlation is a popular method, and it's basically measuring the strength of the linear relationship between each of the features. And the result of that gives us a value uh, that ranges from negative one to positive one, with values closer to positive one and negative one indicating strong relationships between the features, whereas values that are closer to zero indicate little to no relationship. In this example here, we've got our well log measurements and we're running them through the, the process and it's ranking them based on the Pearson's correlation value. And then we get out the, the final results, uh, people that are involved with machine. And then we take those free inputs or free outputs from this, this process and put them into our uh, machine learning model. And then based on that, we can evaluate the performance and then decide whether we want to take the maybe the top four inputs rather than the top three. So just to illustrate uh, again with Pearson's correlation, so this is a heat map of the correlation strength between each of the variables within a data set. And if we are comparing this all against DTS, which is our shear slowness, and we are wanting to predict that, then we can see how the features relate or the input curves relate to that target feature. So as we would expect, DT or the acoustic compressional slowness is the highest ranked uh, feature there as they're, they're very highly correlated with each other. 
Then we've got Gamma Ray, Caliper, Row B, Def, and then eventually NVI at the at the bottom. Uh, so we would then be able to take, uh, say, the top three curves, top four curves, and again, maybe using a bit of domain knowledge, so maybe Caliper isn't really the most suitable uh, input curve for our model, and we can drop that out. So there's always that um, reliance on their domain expertise rather than relying strictly on the algorithms. Then we've got wrapper based methods and a popular example of this is the backward feature elimination process and these methods evaluate a specific model, for example, multilinear regression with different subsets of the data. So initially we're giving the, 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 the process all of our input curves and as part of that it goes into a, a machine learning algorithm and then it is evaluating some of the features and we end up with a number of statistics. So within a multilinear regression, we can have our significance level or p-value, probability value, and uh, that tells us how significant those input curves are in relation to the target curve. And then it will eliminate any that are above a threshold that we define. So typically it's 0 0.05 for the, the p-value. And then it will take the remaining features and then go back into the learning algorithm, evaluate the, the results and then eliminate uh, again any more that are above that uh, threshold. And that will continue until uh, there's very little change in the, the p-values or the data that's uh, being uh, excluded. So once that's done, we end up with eliminating some of the, the curves iteratively and we end up with our final features. So we can then take those final features and then pass them into our machine learning model and evaluate the performance of that uh, machine learning model with those features. Then we've got embedded type methods and one that we've got within IP is the experienced eye feature selection method. And what we're doing is the the whole process of evaluating the model and generating the subsets is all part of the the algorithm selection. So pass in all of the original inputs, and then we gen uh, the algorithm generates a subset of that, tests the model, evaluates the performance, and then iterates over that until it gets a, a better accuracy score at the end. And what we get out is a set of feature importances. So here we've got our input curves and they've all been ranked in relation to our target variable. And that gives us an indication of how important these features are. And usually we will have a score associated with them, whether it's a, a percentage or um, a, a numerical value related to the metric that's used as part of the algorithm. And then uh, we can use that to uh, understand how our model has reached its conclusions, which helps with the interpretability uh, of our model. So one of the main challenges with um, sort of doing some of the processes that we've just seen where we are um, going through the data, selecting the features, running a machine learning model and evaluating the performance is that it can be a very time consuming and manual process. So to put this into perspective, my, my colleague uh, Ross Brackenridge, who's on, on the call and myself, uh, we're working on the, the paper for Experienced Eye a few years ago and uh, probably took uh, a week or two just to go through all of the models that we had um, to be able to um, get our results for the for the paper. So it was very manual. We're doing it step by step. And just as to illustrate that, if we start at a very basic level of comparing the three different feature selection methods and three different machine learning models, we can end up with nine separate runs through this, this process where we've got our data, selecting our features, and then passing it into the, uh, the machine learning model and evaluating the performance. If we were then to take the top three to top eight ranked features from each of these methods, we could end up with potentially 54 separate runs through this data. And additionally, we would be evaluating the performance not only on the training data, but also on the test data. So there's extra time added at the end as well when we're trying to evaluate our model. So doing this manually could take several days and you may not have that time uh, available to you within a, within a project. So you need to get things done as quickly as possible when you're uh, say making your predictions. 
So, so one way that we can help this process is by automating it. And this allows us to run multiple models at the click of a single button. So it's running all those 54 separate runs and it's generating the results. So what could take several days is now just down to a few minutes of time, which uh, and then you can evaluate the results from that and then pick the best performing models. And that's what we've implemented within our module experienced eye. So when we're comparing multiple models, as I said, we it's a slow and manual process and can be time consuming and it can be difficult to identify the best models and the best combination of input data. And it's often a lot of trial and error to, to be able to do this. So the solution that we've come up with for this is uh, an automated method that carries out all of the feature selection methods uh, that we've discussed and automates the machine learning process to allow you to easily compare the the results from different models. So with Experienced Eye, we've basically got a new module that's been developed from the ground up. So we've taken our, uh, we've added new modules and added new methods in here, or feature selection methods, and we're using our existing curve prediction modules with an IP to generate some results and metrics from, from that. And it's included with the IP basic license. So anyone that's got the, the basic license for IP can access this module and run the, the input curves through it and see what the results are or what the results are likely to be. And this makes it easy to compare different curve choices and models and also automates and streamlines the, the process of uh, coming up with the best uh, or one of the a more accurate model for making your predictions with. So at a very high level, the experienced eye module, which we'll go on to uh, next, uh, basically takes our input curves and then carries out a number of data QC checks. So checks for missing data and whether we've got duplicate curves, et cetera. And then it passes that data into the feature selection models and takes the top three to top eight ranked features from those models. It then passes those um, input curves or features into our machine learning models, and then we can evaluate the performance. And that whole process is just a, a click of a button. And as I say, as I say it takes a, a few minutes to run through all of the algorithms. So with that, I will now jump over to IP. So you should be able to see IP on the screen now. <clears throat> okay, so when, when you're in IP, um, yeah, when, when you're in IP um, with the, the new new interface that we, we see here, so some people may still be using the, the old interface, but Experience I will be under uh, the machine learning menu or in the older interface, it will be under um, advanced interpretation, and then it will be down with the machine learning modules. So with the, the machine learning menu, we've got Experience I at the top here, and when we click on that, we then launch the module that we see on, on the right here. And it's very simple, it's a very simple interface uh, and there's very few tabs on it at the moment, which uh, basically allows us to define our inputs, outputs and our options, as well as visualizing the, the results of the modeling process. So on the inputs tab, we have our reference curve or our target curve. And in this case, I've selected density and we've got the option to select logarithmic. So if we're dealing with uh, data that has quite a wide range of values, such as permeability, where we're going from values as low as you know, 0.01 millidarcies all the way up to 1,000 or 10,000 millidarcies, then we would want to use the logarithmic option for that. And it, behind the scenes, it just takes a log base 10 of that data. Down on the bottom half is where we pass in our input curves and we can pass them in um, the same way as any other IP module with uh, dropping uh, the drop down list and we can then select the, the curves that we want to pass in or we can go over to the, the curve sets and then drag and drop a, a curve in from our data set and put it into that, uh, that row or again we can select multiple curves and drag them all in. We can turn curves on and off with the enabled uh, option here uh, so don't really want that 
last one on there uh so we can tick that off and then we've got our gas curves as well as our standard logging curves and you'll see that i've put in the bs curve which is our um bit size curve and that should be a constant value unless we've got multiple whole sections then we will have a, a stepped um value with that so as part of the process it will recognize that that is a constant curve and then it will eliminate it from uh, the modeling as we don't really want to be putting that into our machine learning models. Um, and you can choose the order of the, the inputs as well. And this is important as you can then take the, as, as experienced, I will take the, the results from, oh, sorry, the, the selection that you've got here uh, and then use it within each of the machine learning models. So you could do a model based on your domain expertise. Um, so whether uh, you, you know that, say, gamma ray is a very important curve in predicting density in this, this particular well or this scenario, then you can um, set that to the top there and see how that performs when it goes through to the, the machine learning models. Uh, same with the, the others, but you also get the chance to then uh, as we'll see in the results tab, to go and re, uh, change that order and then rerun the models with a new order. So that could be based on the results from the other models. So perhaps it, uh, just for instance, maybe Caliper has been ranked number one in a couple of the models for some reason. Uh, you may think that that's not really necessary and then remove it from the, the modeling uh, in your, your ranking and then rerun the, the algorithm. So I'm not going to run this module directly as I say it could take a few few minutes to to run so just uh, for the interest of time for the, this uh, presentation uh, we'll just go straight on to a previously run run model uh, but as I say it does take just a few minutes with all options on and that will depend on uh, the amount of data that you're passing through this so with a, yeah 500 meters uh, yeah five just over 500 meters uh, that, as I say that takes probably two three four minutes at the, at the very most um, when I was. So that's what I encountered when running this uh, yesterday uh, with, with testing it. So there's limited output curves from this, but we, we get uh, an input uh, an input row flag. So if the flag, if the row has passed all the data quality checks that it's not null and it's not a constant curve, then we get a flag indicating that the row has qualified for modeling. And then our training data and test data is split randomly, as we'll see in the next next tab. And we get a flag out indicating what data has been used for training the model and what has been used for testing the model. So within the, the options tab, we have uh, a number of options for setting up our feature selection methods and machine learning models. So the first one is to um, look at the Pearson's correlation again. So this is slightly different from what we've discussed. It's looking now at uh, similarity between the, the curves. So in the case where uh, we have um, duplicate curves, then that will be caught by the QC checks. But if we've got a case where, we've, where we're feeding in two porosities, uh, so a porosity that's been measured in decimal units and porosity that's been measured in percentage units, and we may have accidentally put them into the model, then the, the Pearson's correlation should catch that because they'll, they'll be exactly the same curve, but on a, just a slightly different scale. Uh, so setting that up to 0.99 or, or 1, uh, if they're exactly the same, then it will be caught and then removed from the, the modeling process. Then we've got our feature selection method. So we've got experienced eye feature selection itself. So this is the, the main uh, feature selection model within, uh, within this module. Uh, and that is based on DTA or domain transfer analysis. So that is, uh, as I say, an embedded method that is using DTA to work out the, the feature importance or the most important features within the data set that we're passing in. Then we've got Pearson's correlation, backward feature elimination, and also the user defined order. So as I mentioned earlier, in the inputs car uh, on the inputs tab, if the, the curves are in a specific order, then we can pass them through to the machine learning models. Then we've got our 
got our um, prediction model uh, for training and testing. So this is where we take our entire subset. So if we've got a thousand rows of data, then 70% of that will be used to um, train the model. So 700 rows and then the remaining 300 rows will be used to evaluate and test the model. And that's where we get our metrics from then else statements. like. So this is a completely randomized process as uh, one of uh, the ways that uh, we do it in machine learning is we just take a random sampling through that, that data. Uh, but we are looking at adding more uh, methods in, such as stratified sampling, which um, which is probably a bit more appropriate for uh, geological data. And then we've got our prediction models. Again, um, we've got DTA, domain transfer analysis, multilinear regression, and neural network. And then we are looking to add more models into this, uh, including a potential uh, decision forest, a random forest type model. Uh, as well as a few of our other modules within IP. So once you've chosen the methods to run and the models to run, so obviously if you've only got one feature selection method and one uh, machine learning model, then it's going to be much quicker than running with all of the, the models, but then you won't have the overview of how different models react to your, your data. So once you run that model, you get a data summary, which is used, and we arrive at an answer. The processing, which, which uh, curves have been dropped out as part of the quality checks, and whether curves contain uh, missing values. If they are, then they're not. Th that entire row is not used within the modeling process. And then we come to the results tab, and this is our main view of how the models are performing and gives us an understanding of what features are the most important as well as the performance on the machine learning. So at the top here, we've got our individual rankings from each of the methods. So we've got our influence percentage or influence factor from uh, experienced eye feature selection. And we can see that we've got neutron, gamma ray and photoelectric photo at the top. And then we've got backward feature elimination, again, with very similar inputs, uh, but then the fourth one down is slightly different. So we've got resistivity instead of gas or average gas values. And then each of the other methods, uh, the Pearson's correlation is slightly different and then our user ranking. So with this, we've got different values on here, and these are all relative to the method that is used. So we've influence factors, it's a percentage, We've then got the probability value or p-value for backward feature elimination. And then we've got our Pearson's correlation, which is an absolute score. Uh, so as I say, the Pearson correlation can go from minus one to positive one. So we've just taken the absolute value and then sorted it based on that. And with the user rankings, as I mentioned, you can change the order of them. And there is a link in the top right to, to do that. So you can come in here and then move these up and down uh, to say whether you want uh, maybe resistivity is the best performing curves in here and gamma is a little bit less important. Then you can come in here and then rerun the machine learning models for this new ranking. In the middle section, we have the results from all of the machine learning models that uh, we've we've run. Uh, I think in this case, uh, I think there was about 70 70 plus uh, separate runs that, that were being calculated in the background to, to generate this. So we've got various metrics that we can use to evaluate the performance of the machine learning model. We've got those rules, we can then apply R squared. And that goes from zero to one with values that are closer to one indicating that we've got a better uh, result between our actual measurements and our predicted measurements. And it's essentially fitting a line of best fit through uh, through that data and seeing whether we have um, a good prediction or not. And this can be illustrated in the bottom right. So this is a, a cross plot of our actual measurements against our predicted measurements. And we can see that we've got um, our, our data forming along this one to one line. If all our points were exactly predict, are predicted exactly the same as our actual measurements, then we may have an issue with with the model, and that would give us an R squared of one. Uh, so we it's essentially predicted on itself and and not really done done a good job. 
Uh, so we typically look for something that's uh, slightly lower than one, but anything that's very low, such as say uh, 0 0.4 here on R squared, you'll see that the correlation is quite uh, spread out. Now I can fix these values as well to say one to three, so that when we go between a better performing model, we can see the difference between uh, the results of that uh, that model. And then some models are really poor, uh, in terms of what they what they've got out, so having a visual aid to understand how the data has or how the actual measurements are compare with the predicted measurements is something that's very very useful. But we also have other metrics. We also have the mean absolute error, uh, which is basically measuring the the average uh, differences between the actual and and the predicted result. And then we've got root mean square error, which is doing something similar, but it's uh, also taking the square root, uh, which can can help and give extra information about um, outliers. Machine learning, there are three main types. You can see that the, the metrics update uh, based on that, and also the, the color remains the same. So our poor performing results in this case are higher values, and our better performing results are lower values. So rather than looking at just uh, numeric values, we do have uh, a chart down in the bottom left, which is basically a visual representation of this grid. And we can see that uh, we've got comparing different prediction models for a particular feature selection model. So in this case, e, uh, experience eye feature selection, backward feature elimination, and Pearson's correlation. And then we can see how our prediction model compares for each of the feature selection methods. On the other hand, we can also see how the different feature selection methods compare for a specific machine learning model. So in this case, we are comparing all of our feature selections for DTA. And if there's a model in here that you really like, uh, we'll just take uh, one at random. You can right click and then open and selected model and uh, module. And then from that, you can add additional wells in here and then do your, your prediction. So I don't think I've got any curves set up for some of this, and then it will pick up the, the input curves. So you may need to check the input curves before running this, but it allows you to develop your models in a key well and then make predictions on other wells within the data set. To get a summary of the, the best performing models, so rather than looking at the grid and rather than looking at the charts, we have provided a nice summary of the top three results for each metric. So we can go to the R squared, and then we can see the top performing results. And we can also switch over to our testing data set. And this tells us, or can tell us, how well our model is generalizing to, to unseen data. So we should ideally be looking for similar uh, values in the training and testing results. Uh, but if we've got drastic changes, such as a high value within our, our training data set and then a low value within the testing data set, then that may indicate that our model is not performing well and it is overfitting. So in addition to loading or saving out the module, uh, models to uh, the module, we can save them out to set files, which can then be used to um, we can export multiple ones and they can all be used um in all the machine learning modules within ip so that's uh the experienced eye module at a, a very high high level and i'll just go over to back to powerpoint and we should summarize the module um so Feature selection, as we've seen, can play an important role within the machine learning workflows. It allows us to identify the most relevant and most important features in relation to what we're attempting to predict. It can help speed algorithms up and it can also um, reduce the impact of overfitting. It also reduces the need for repetitive trial and error. As seen earlier, when we were doing the process manually, we ended up with 54 separate runs, different combinations of 
a feature selection methods, machine learning models and input curves. And that can take up a significant amount of time and also ends up with being uh, trial and error and a bit repetitive. So you may not have that time available to you in, in the project. And this is where IP's experienced eye module comes into play and it helps streamline and automates the trial and error process. And it also helps you identify the best performing models so that you can carry on with your, your workflow. However, as with any machine learning or automated methods, it's always best practice and it's always wise to be cautious uh, when, when using them. And you should always uh, use your domain expertise, whether that's in petrophysics, geology or geoscience, uh, to validate and check that the results from the predictions and that the selection of input curves makes sense. Uh, and uh, allows you to then dive deeper into your data to see, OK, maybe a curve does have a, a relation to our target variable that we never really thought of. And you can then dive into that much more. So I just want to say thank you very much for listening and I hope you've enjoyed today's uh, Geoactive webinar. And we can now take some questions from the audience that have been typed in. And if you have any questions that you have not submitted yet, uh, please use the chat or the, the Q&A section on Teams and uh, we'll see if we can answer them. But if we if we run out of time and we can't answer them, then we will uh, come back uh, to you afterwards. So with that, um, yeah, we'll go over to, to the questions. Andy, yeah, we've got a couple of questions come through. So we've got one that says, I didn't see any curve normalization of input curves in your ML workflow. Can you please explain it if, if mm -hmm. it is not required <clears throat> in these modules, SOM, NN, PCA, DTA, et cetera? Yep. Uh, so it's, yeah, it's a hard one. So depending on what you mean by normalization, so the, Within petrophysics, normalization for us is, say, taking two gamma rays and normalizing the values to, to each other. But uh, within machine learning, it uh, also means um, dealing with log curves or data that is on multi scale. So, with curves, rusty, which is you know, one, one to three grams per cc, and with resistivity, which is all the way up to the, the thousands, then we're dealing with different log scales. So, we would need to account for that within some of the algorithms, certainly within, um, within a neural network. With DTA, that's uh, the data retains its identity, so you don't really need to carry out that normalization. Uh, but um, it's yeah, it depends on the algorithm. I say uh, some algorithms can handle it. Another one is um, random forest, which uh, you don't really need to do that as it's part of the the decision tree process uh, in there. Uh, so it's again, it's, it's model dependent and data dependent. Uh, but it's always you can always try both and see if that helps to improve your your model. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Hopefully that answers or helps answer your question. Yeah. Um, and yeah. the next one is DTA seems to be the best tool in your example. Is the number of samples for learning DTA still limited to a couple of hundred feet? Yeah, so with with, uh, with DTA, uh, we are limited to um, a certain value. Is that, I think it was about four or seven, 470 data points. Uh, as we start to go above that, then the the processing time for DTA can then become exponentially large. So we limit it to 470 data points at, at the very most. But as part of that process, it, it's also looking at the distribution of that data. So it's, it's taking samples from the highest values as well as the lowest values. And it's um, it, and then it's doing some internal uh, maths to find the best relationship from that. So it's capturing the the variability within within that data. But uh, that, that is something that, that, that that's something that we we might look at in the future, see if we can improve the performance of that, because um, it is quite uh, com computationally intensive uh, with with that. Um, but yeah. Um, the next one uh, is experienced eye considered to be a type of ensemble learning? No, so ensemble learning is uh, when we're dealing with, say, decision trees and uh, random forests. So we're taking multiple iterations through through a tree and then um, 
yeah, so taking multiple trees and combining them together and then combining the power of, of that. But with uh, experienced eye, uh, as I say, it's an embedded method. So it's part of the domain transfer analysis uh, um, modeling process, I, I guess, is probably one way to put it. So it's not really an ensemble learning in, in that sense. OK, and the final yeah. question we've got here is, is the new module already available or will it be released soon? OK, so the the new module went out in IP 5.3, which went out last week. And. Yeah, so it's already available and as I say, it's on the basic license when you. Um, I think with 531, which is coming out next month, uh, there will be that option for Pearson's correlation coefficient within the the options tab to allow you to identify highly correlated um, features or input curves. Uh, but at the moment, it's it's fully working and fully usable. Uh, it's just that additional feature comes uh, comes next month. OK, well, there doesn't seem to be any more questions okay. in the chat, which is good timing. If there are any further questions, then please feel free to contact um, any of us and we will endeavour to get back to you. OK. Oh, the only other thing to say, sorry, is that there will be a recording made available. So we uh, we will uh, can, se can send you a link to a recording of the presentation if you need to, if you'd like to go back to it. OK. OK, that's great. So, yeah, uh, with that, uh, I guess we'll finish the, the webinar. So I just want to say thank you again for, for listening and I hope it's been useful. And as Claire said, you can reach out to us uh, sort of via email or even over on LinkedIn if you want to to get in touch with any any questions and uh, we'll gladly answer them. So again, thank you and hope you all have a, a good day or a good evening wherever you are. Okay. Thanks, Andy.